uh, in this lecture, we're going to look at um, noise uh, and, uh, and fluctuations. And there's um, Jackson Pollock's Blue Poles, which you can see in the National Gallery when it, uh, when it reopens. Okay, so um, in almost all real systems, there are, are fluctuations. Um, and these are not merely thermodynamic systems, but systems which are well outside of what you normally think of as physics. Things like the stock market, the size of classes, voter behavior, intelligence gathering, image processing. So you want to process this image, it's got an awful lot of noise in it. And you want to say, well, can we get rid of the noise? Okay. And um, often in experiments, you want to remove the noise. Okay. As much as you possibly can. Okay. But in... Uh, in reality, noise is a natural phenomenon, and often the noise can give you extra information uh, in your experiment. So maybe you don't want to remove it, or if you do want to remove it, first you, you study it. Okay, so we've already looked at thermodynamic fluctuations in this course. So you take a system in equilibrium um, and look at the fluctuations in particle number in a small volume V. Okay, so in a small volume V, suppose it's a gas, for example, there'll be some particles, okay? But of course, um, if you take your volume small enough, then the number of particles um, can change a little bit. So you might only have that many particles at a certain time. And, okay, um, and if you do the calculation, you will find, I think as you've done already, that the fluctuation, the number of particles squared, the average of that minus the average of the number of particles squared is equal to uh, the number of particles squared, the average of that, times kt times kappa tor kappa t divided by the volume and kappa t here is the isothermal compressibility which is defined to be that okay it's the it's uh, the vdp divided by v or minus that at constant temperature um, so for an ideal gas where we have um, pv equals nkt uh, we find kappa can be calculated quite easily the isothermal compressibility is just one on the pressure okay and if we plug that into our formula up here, we find the fluctuation in the number of particles, uh, well, the square of that fluctuation is equal to n squared kt divided by pv, which is just n squared on n, which is roughly, of course, um, n. Okay, so uh, what we find is the, flux the square fluctuation is proportional to the number of particles you have on average. Okay, so the relative fluctuation uh, is just n squared average minus n squared, n average squared, divided by the average of n squared, take the square root, and that gives you a relative fluctuation of, of 1 on n. Okay. Now, um, this doesn't just apply to a gas, it applies to enormous numbers of systems. Uh, most systems, if you say, okay, suppose you take, um, say, suppose you took the honours class. The typical honours class at this university has about 16 students in it. Okay, but you in a system like that, you expect fluctuations from year to year of order root 16, in other words, 4. Okay, so if you say, well, some years you might get 20, and some years you might get 12, um, and that's, that's a reasonable fluctuation to have, and you wouldn't put any store on that. If you got 20 in one year, you might you wouldn't say, oh, we're attracting lots more students. If you got 12, you wouldn't say we're attracting a lot less students. Um, what you'd say is that's within the random kind of variation you'd expect, okay? And, and often journalists write ridiculous articles in newspapers looking at, um, you know, things. So there might be, there might be 10 murders a year in, physic, in, in, uh, in Sydney, sorry. Um, and uh, the year after that, there might be 13. And, of course, this looks like a, a incredible. This is a 30% increase. But, in fact, it's what you expect. You know, next year it'll be 7 Okay, it's you know it's it's a random fluctuation, and you expect random fluctuations to be of order, the square root of the size of your number. Uh, in other words, the relative uh, fluctuation is one on the square root of n. Okay, so that that applies to many systems, not just to gases. So, uh, in thermodynamic systems, this number one on the square root of n is usually tiny. So we're talking the systems of 10 to the 23 molecules, and 1 on the square root of 10 to the 23 is not a big number. Okay, But in some systems, n can be quite small. So um, if you take in the atmosphere a box of size equal to the wavelength for light, um, 
you find it under standard conditions of temperature and pressure that amounts to about 10 to the 6 particles and a flac fractional fluctuation of 0.07%, um, which is enough to contribute to the scattering of light and the blueness of the sky. So, um, so you can look at uh, systems which do have quite small number of particles and they do have a big effect. Uh, a second example might be from uh, my own research area. We have a rotaxane molecule, which is a, uh, uh, an axle, which has two stoppers at the end, and you thread another molecule onto it. Okay, um, And you can make this, that's one with only one ring, but you can make ones with many rings. And you could take an area here and say along that length, how many uh, rings on average do you have? Well, in that case, you might only have only two rings on average, and therefore the fluctuations... Uh, can be extremely large as you make a very very noisy system okay uh, because you've only got one two three four or five uh, rings on the whole on the whole molecule okay so sometimes they can be very very large these fluctuations okay um, the book I'm going to use here for um, some of this work is by Charles Cattell he wrote a book on solid state physics which is very well known um, uh, but his book on ele elementary stat phys is also uh, very good. Uh, the word elementary here should be taken with a pinch of salt. It's not really an elementary book at all. Some of the arguments are very advanced, um, but it is a nice book. Um, and Charles Cattell, like a lot of physicists, basically lived forever. He died only recently at the age of 102 or 103. So, um, and, uh, so uh, he's written a very nice book there. All right, so um, one of the things we're going to look at first is electronic noise. Now, in physics, uh, particularly in experimental physics, we're almost always looking at measuring things um, using some kind of electronic signal. So the measurement is almost always converted into an electronic signal be before we put it through uh, analysis. Um, so electronic noise is absolutely crucial um, in these systems. Uh, and often we're dealing with systems which have very, very, very um, little signal, uh, and you'll have to remove the noise somehow, or at least understand where the noise comes from. Okay, so the simplest kind of noise uh, we can look at is across um, so-called storage elements, which means capacitors and inductors. So if we have a, a signal across a capacitor, here's our capacitor, okay, we're just going to measure the voltage across it. Here's the voltage across it. We're not putting a battery there. We're just measuring the voltage across it due to noise. Okay. Um, now, we could have some signal occurring this due to a battery or some other sort of thing. So we could measure the, 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 the signal as being this, and this will be our fluctuation. Okay. Um, averaged over time, we expect the fluctuation to be zero. That, in fact, is somehow the definition of what the fluctuation signal is. But the square of the fluctuation, on average, will not be zero. Okay. Um, now, how do we calculate what the square of the voltage fluctuation will be? Well, a capacitor um, stores energy of a half CV squared, where V is the voltage uh, across the capacitor. And that is quadratic in V. Okay? Now, that means we can apply equipartition, because um, in uh, a system which has a Hamiltonian with a, um, a quadratic term, we know that each quadratic term will contribute to the um, to the uh, energy um, a half kBT. Okay, so just as for a system with kinetic energy, we get a half mv squared equals a half kBT. For this system, we get a half C V fluctuation squared equals a half kBT. So that's the equation for the noise signal across a capacitor. And if you do the same thing for an inductor, you can do the same thing. This is the energy stored in an inductor, it's got the current squared there, not the voltage squared, and that's also equal to a half kBT. So those systems are quite simple to understand. How big is this? Well, okay, at room temperature, kBT is 10 to the minus 21 joules, or 4 times 10 to the minus 21 joules. Um, the smallest capacity you can buy at a local, uh, local store has about a capacitance of 1 picofarad, okay? And so the average value of V squared is 6 microvolts for that capacitor. And that's not insignificant in, in many precise experiments. So that uh, gives you an idea that this kind of noise, due entirely, in fact, to thermal effects, you can see there's a K, KBT there, that's, that's entirely due to thermal stuff, um, is, uh, is not insignificant. Okay, now you can, of course, reduce that noise by cooling things down towards absolute zero. And that's what you do in some experiments. You cool your, uh, 
uh, antenna collecting the signal and, and this noise can go away. All right, so that's, that's for storage elements. That's for inductors and capacitors. Now, um, there are other elements in electric circuits and those elements are called resistors. And of course, there are nonlinear elements as well, like um, um, transistors, we won't go into those. So, let's look at resistors. Uh, and in resistors, you have this Johnson-Nyquist noise, which we're now gonna look at. Um, now, we can't use equal partition for resistors um, because they're purely dissipative and they don't have quadratic terms of the Hamiltonian, they're dissipative systems. They don't, you don't have a Hamiltonian with uh, some storage terms, it doesn't happen, okay? Um, and uh, our story begins in some sense with the beginning of the uh, electronic age in 906 where um, uh, the uh, valve, the electronic valve was invented and that allows you to amplify signals and switch things electronically and they were replaced by transistors and later on by integrated circuits of course. So, um, so at the very early stages of the electronic age um, a man called John John Johnson in 1926, working at Bell Labs, which has done much of the um, fundamental work and also some of the practical work associated with electronics, um, was just measuring the noise voltage across a resistor. Uh, and he found some measurements. Uh, and this, this noise measurements, which we'll go into in a minute, uh, w these measurements were explained by his colleague, colleague Harry Nyquist. And so therefore the noise across a resistor is called Johnson Nyquist noise, or often it's just called Nyquist noise. Okay, just for, I think uh, it just sounds nice, Nyquist, Nyquist noise. Okay, so um, what the result that uh, the gentleman attained is, is, is as follows. Okay, it says that if you have resistance R, uh, and if we measure the noise only in a frequency range delta, delta nu, so that's our frequency range, we're going to measure it between, say, 100 hertz and 400 hertz. In other words, delta nu is, is therefore 300, 300 hertz. Okay. If we um, measure it in that range, what we find is the square of the voltage fluctuation uh, due to thermal effects is just 4 times resistance times kVt times the frequency range. Now, when I say measure it in a frequency range, how do we measure things in a frequency range? We just use a bandpass filter. So we use a bandpass filter to cut out all frequencies outside this range. So we might have... Um, some kind of uh, frequency spectrum here uh, where you have say power versus frequency and you might have some little weird things like this so we're just going to put a, a, a thing which on, which only samples those those particular um, frequencies there so bandpass filter okay and this is an example of a fluctuation dissipation theorem but it's a very very simple equation right the square of the voltage fluctuation is four times r times kvt times the frequency range um, very very simple all right, so I'm going to give you a couple of arguments deriving this particular law. Um, neither of these arguments I believe myself, uh, but I'm going to give them to you anyway because they're the only arguments that really exist in a, in a sort of elementary fashion. So, um, the first argument, which is very, very shaky, okay? We're going to take a frequency range delta nu, uh, and we're going to take a resistor with a current I passing through it, and of course... The power dissipated in the resistor is I squared R. Um, and we need to get somehow out of out of KBT and, and delta nu a, a power. And the only way you can get that is by multiplying those two things together. Okay. Uh, and therefore you have V equals IR as well. And so you get V squared is proportional to KBT R times delta nu. It's a very shaky argument based upon dimensional analysis and a bit of physical guesswork, okay? It's not something you could trust very well, but if you're stuck in the middle of nowhere with no physics books, um, you could probably come up with that answer, okay? There's a more sophisticated way of deriving this, which actually gives you the factor of four, okay? And that is a transmission line argument. Now, a transmission line is something like, um, classically, uh, you think of it as a coaxial cable with a bit of cable in the middle, some resistance here, uh, some dielectric insulator, I mean, um, and a, metal a metallic shield on the outside, which is the other other, other, other electrode. Um, that's a classical transmission line. And normally what happens is you have an input to the line, and at the other end you have an output, uh, and in the middle you model all this stuff by something which has resistance and inductance uh, and maybe some capacitance and some other resistance or other, other, other bits and pieces as well. So you measure, you model it with a, 
a whole chain of resistors are inductors and capacitors. Okay, um, and engineering textbooks will go into this in great length, and I posted some videos about this as well. Okay, so we're going to look at a, a very simple transmission line, which has uh, an input end and an output end and waves which travel down the line at speed c, okay? Um, and we're going to choose a lossless line. So there's no resistance in the line at all, but we do have resistance at the end. There's two resistors there, but in the line itself, there's no resistance. And the impedance of our line is just the inductance divided by c, square root of that, okay? And we've got matching resistances r at either end, uh, and the matching means that the energy traveling down the line is absorbed completely by the resistors at each end. And there's no reflected waves. You put some energy down here, it doesn't get reflected back. It gets absorbed by this guy because there's a matched, matched resistance there. So uh, what happens here? Well, what happens is you get standing waves set up in our, in our line. Okay? And the fundamental mode has that frequency. Because remember, you probably remember from your organ pipe analysis of things, that's the fundamental frequency uh, for standing waves. Okay, that's that one there. And then you have other excited frequencies. Okay, C is the speed of the wave, L is the length of our line. Okay. So, um, our system now looks like a black body because at any finite temperature, all the higher, not higher modes, I-G-H-E-R, right, uh, are also excited. And those are excited with frequency n times mu1, that's the fundamental mode, where n is 1, 2, 3, etc, etc, etc. And because it looks like a black body, um, the occupation number of the nth mode is going to be that, uh, and the energy in the nth mode is given by this thing here. Okay, that's the occupation number, the energy is h times mu n. Okay, in the classical limit, which is what we're normally interested in here, uh, we just get kVt. Okay, we just count that. Now we're going to just count all the modes. In a frequency range delta nu, there are delta nu on nu1 modes, one of these classical counting arguments which you've used before. Um, and so the total energy is kBT nu divided by, or delta nu, sorry, divided by nu1, which is 2 kBT L delta nu on divided by C, using the fact that nu1 here you can get from this. Let me get rid of this stuff. Okay, that's new one there, the fundamental mode, frequency. Okay, so that's our result so far for the energy. Okay, now this energy is in two travelling waves. A travelling wave set up a standing wave, of course, each moving in opposite directions. Uh, with a time need, time of that needed to traverse the line, that's the time you need to go across the line, because it's uh, along the line, because it's length L and uh, speed C. Uh, the energy per unit time absorbed by each resistor, by each of them, is E divided by 2T, okay? That's the energy, uh, and then there's a factor of 2 there because we divide by 2 for the two resistors, and that's T the time. So that's the power absorbed by each resistor, KVT delta nu. Um, and there we go again, the power is KVT delta nu, okay? Now, um, the voltage across the resistor is 2IR because we remember we've got, here I'm measuring the voltage here, and if I go along here, I've got a resistance here R, not as an impedance actually, but it's a lossless bit, so that's just still got an impedance R. There's another resistance R at the other end, so um, we've got a current I throwing through it, so V is equal to 2IR, we've got the two, two R's there and the I, V equals IR in other words. Uh, so I is V on 2R, okay, uh, and then we can plug that into there, okay, and get the fact that V squared is 4 kVT R delta nu. And that is what was measured by Mr. Johnson. And here are his experimental results, which have the voltage squared versus resistance. And you can see he's measured it for carbon filament, which I understand what that is. Advanced wire, I have no idea what that is, but it's some, obviously some kind of weird wire they had back in 1926. Um, and then he's also measured it curiously for all kinds of solutions, because of course you just get resistance in, in copper sulfate solution and sodium chloride solution, and whatever this one is. Um, calcium nitrate uh, in H2O, I wouldn't have thought that was very soluble, but apparently it is. Um, and you can measure the resistance across all, for all those systems, uh, and what you find is 
they all obey this particular law extremely well uh, for the fluctuations in the voltage. Now, um, of course, having said that, um, this argument here, using the transmission line, uh, I think there's only two classes of people who would believe this argument. There's the first class of people who are extremely gullible and will believe anything you tell them. Uh, and the second class of people who have a very deep understanding of physics uh, and can see this argument has to be true. Okay? Unfortunately, I lie in between those two extremes, and so I don't necessarily ascribe to this argument, but the experimental result is un undoubted uh, that this is the correct result. It's done experimentally, many, many different experiments. You can do it easily yourself, probably. Um, and uh, so the result there is, is certainly true, and that's a very, very fundamental result because it tells you what voltage fluctuations you can expect just due to thermal effects in your system across your resistor. And so it's a very, very important result. You can estimate how big the noise should be and see uh, if that's what you're getting in an experiment. So we'll finish that uh, lecture 